it is 6.30, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Jacob Turner. On behalf of the Arkansas Conference Center for Communication, I want to thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, just a few messages that I'd like to uh, let y'all know about. This is a Zoom meeting, but you will find that you are not able to uh, unmute yourself or start your video. Uh, this is intentional as we want to make sure that our participants uh, have the opportunity to get their presentations in full because we do have a very action-packed schedule tonight. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, we would like to ask that you hold your questions until the end uh, at the appropriate time. We will ask for them and then you will be able to post them in the chat. Um, with all of that, I will turn it over to uh, Arkansas United Methodist Women President, Kathy Blackwood. Kathy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jacob. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to the first of three meetings that we're going to be having focusing on interrupting the school to prison pipeline in Arkansas. Um, I'm pleased that our Conference United Methodist Women with Brenda's leadership will be looking in depth at this social justice issue, the criminalization of communities of color and mass incarceration that United Methodist Women nationwide will be focusing on for the next four years. Little did we know in August 2019 at our conference leadership planning team meeting when Brenda first proposed a series of meetings to highlight this social injustice that we would not be bringing this issue into the spotlight in 2020. As you all know, in six months time, our world turned upside down with COVID-19 and we had to learn how to operate in a pandemic world. I'm thankful that Brenda has had the perseverance and patience to gather such a great group of presenters right here in Arkansas to share their knowledge and experiences with how the school to prison pipeline operates in our state. I look forward to hearing from Tina, Chris and Kevin this evening and I hope all of you will join us again for the next two weeks to see how we can all make a difference in shining a light on this systemic form of racism that needs to be addressed here in Arkansas and throughout our country. Thanks again to our presenters this evening for sharing your knowledge and to Brenda for gathering us together and for Jacob Turner from the Arkansas Conference Communications Office for his technical expertise in every meeting he has helped Conference United Methodist women attend virtually for this past year. Brenda, I turn the meeting back over to you. Thank you, Kathy. Good evening and welcome, and please join me as we pray. Holy and loving God, we pause to acknowledge you and invite you into our space tonight, making it a sacred space. On this Earth Day, we're reminded of the psalmist who wrote, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. You made your glory higher than heaven. From the mouths of nursing babies, you have laid a foundation because of your foes in order to stop vengeful enemies. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set in place firmly, what are human beings that you should think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? You've made them only slightly less than divine crowning them with glory and grandeur. You've let them rule over your handiwork, putting everything under their feet. We acknowledge that we have not done a very good job. And we think of man, we are reminded that you are mindful of every man, woman, and child who lives now or who will live in the future. And you have told us what you require of our time on this earth, to act justly, love mercy, and to be humble alongside you. Powerful and merciful God, we pause to thank you for the mercy and justice that we witnessed this week. Mercy and justice because all life is sacred to you and must be to us as well. Actually, Lord, that is why we're here tonight. We know that it could not be your plan that a precious resource like our children would spend their days in a prison cell. So we pray that this evening you will enlighten our minds, soften our hearts, and fortify our wills to act however we can to interrupt the school to prison pipeline. Amen. 
Well, it is such a privilege to have you join us for this series of meetings. And I am so excited about introducing our presenters tonight. Uh, the first one I would like to present to you is Tina Fletcher, who is a, a doctoral student at this time. But Tina earned a BA in political science and African American studies from the University of Arkansas and a master's in education from Harvard University. Tina is a former teacher of the year and her work experience includes the offices of former First Lady Michelle Obama and former U.S. Senator Blanche Lincoln. Uh, she's worked with the Southern Education Foundation, the Anacostas Senior High School, and the Memphis Grizzlies. She currently studies education policy at the University of Pennsylvania, and her research focuses on Black teachers' experience with the Praxis exam and the school to prison pipeline. Tina has entitled her talk, Connecting the Dots, a close look at the school to prison pipeline in Arkansas. So please help me welcome Tina Fletcher. Thank you, Brenda. Can everyone hear me? I think so. Okay, great. I am going to get started because I am fearful my presentation is too long. <laughs> And I know Brenda will mute me. And so I'm going to go ahead, <laughs> go ahead and get started. Can you all see my presentation? Um, let me see. Are you all able to see it? Not, not yet. Okay, just one second. Oh, there it is, popped up, okay. Can you guys see it? Okay, Brenda thinks she's not tech savvy. I think I'm the least tech savvy person on this call. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I, I am so grateful for this opportunity because this is such a, this topic is so near and dear to my heart. And after talking to Brenda over the last few weeks, I'm just so grateful that you all have taken this up. Um, it's just so great to see a group highlight this issue and it's not just me or Kevin or Chris <laughs> kind of shouting from the mountaintop. So we are so grateful for you all for doing this. Um, so Brenda introduced me. So fortunately I get to skip a slide, which is wonderful. And I'm gonna go right into my agenda and I'm more than happy to share my presentation for anyone who wants it. Please feel free to reach out and we will make sure you get a copy. So I'm gonna go over three primary areas. One, we're gonna look at incarceration in the United States and in Arkansas, just so you all can see where we stand nationally and internationally. We're then gonna look at academics and discipline and race and region. How does where you're from in the state and how your school ranks, how does that impact, impact your chances of being suspended or expelled? And then I'm not a doom and gloom person, so I like to leave people with examples of success. What can we do to end the school to prison pipeline in Arkansas? So the first part is just looking at incarceration numbers internationally, nationally. I don't have to say anything to describe what these pictures say. You can look at them and see that the United States stands out internationally when it comes to incarceration. We incarcerate more of our population than any country in the world, despite the fact that we are not the largest country size-wise or population-wise. Uh, and if you look at the graph on the, the right, you can see that we outrank the next country three times over, which is the United Kingdom. And I'm gonna go quickly, but again, you'll be able to see these if you'd like a copy of this. Unfortunately, Arkansas is almost worse than the United States when you put it into perspective. We have three, about 3 million people in the state of Arkansas and we outpace the country when it comes to incarceration. We incarcerate more people per 100,000 people than the country. And so we incarcerate more people in our state than most countries in the world, which is very shocking and surprising. Um, when you think about it. Um, the chart on the left, I know that you guys can't see it, but I, I wanna let you know what it means. Um, between 2008 and 2013, almost every state, every state in the United States saw a decline in their prison population with the, with the exception of the states at the bottom. And at the very bottom, the state with the largest increase 
in their prison population was Arkansas by 17%. So not only do we have one of the largest prison populations, we're also growing uh, compared to other states. So as the, the introduction stated, a lot of this does have to do with racing. You can't talk about incarceration in the state of Arkansas without taking into fact that African Americans in Arkansas make up 15% of the population, yet they make up 42% of the prison population. Uh, as compared to white Arkansans who make up 75% of the population, but only 50% of the prison population. And I, I'm a very transparent person. I've had people say to me, well, if you're committing crimes, then you're gonna go to jail. And I oftentimes tell people, which is what the second graph shows, black people are more likely to be arrested and detained and committed compared to any other group for the same infractions or the same crimes. So we know it's just not that black people are committing more crimes, it's that they're being arrested and detained for those crimes at disproportionate rates. And since we're talking about the school to prison pipeline, I wanna talk specifically about youth incarceration. Although the number of, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to minimize you all. <laughs> Although the number of juveniles arrested in the country decreased nationally, Arkansas ranked in the bottom in that number of decreases. So if you look at the top chart on the right, uh, the green area represents Arkansas. And so we had a small decline, but then we leveled off and America is in the, um, in the, the dotted line. This, the bottom chart is what I think is most important. Arkansas actually saw an increase in the, the number of detained juveniles between 1997 and 2015. So even though the country saw a decline, Arkansas saw an increase. I wanted to show you all this picture because, and again, I think Brenda made a comment about, uh, we don't want to see our young people in prison. And I've done this presentation once before to a national group. And you know, when people aren't from Arkansas, I may not touch as much as this one does, but this is a, a rap restraint they used in the Yale County Juvenile Detention Centers before it was outlawed. Um, and it's one of the mechanisms they use to keep kids calm or restrain them. but you know, we don't want our young people going into a juvenile detention center and coming out worse than they were when they went in. And so we have to ask ourselves, are our students coming out better students, coming out better citizens? And the answer is oftentimes no. And some of you may know that Governor Hutchinson visited a juvenile detention center, I think last year on a Friday, and he closed it on Monday morning because he was so disturbed by what he saw. And so these are the things I want us to think about when we look at where our students and the experience they have once they're um, detained. And Brenda, if you could tell me how I'm doing on time, <laughs> that'd be helpful. Okay, so the second part, okay, the second part is doing the math. I think this is the most important part of my presentation because it connects all of the dots on how students go from the classroom to the prison system. And so the first one is looking at, we all know that Arkansas is home to some of the wealthiest people in the world, yet we are in the bottom 10 for education almost every single year. And we're in the top 10 every year for incarceration. We know that in the Delta region of the state, that's where most African-Americans live, and yet it's one of the poorest in the country. And we also know that schools located in this area are oftentimes high minority and high poverty. So when we look at the most, I think the most uh, recent school report cards, and I'm using this data because due to COVID, some of the years since then aren't as strong. Um, in 2018, 1,040 schools in Arkansas were graded. 33 of those schools received an F grade. And I wanted to know what did those schools have in common? And what I found is that those schools were serving majority black student population. Eight of them were in Jefferson County. Nine were in Pulaski County. 100% served students, 70% or more free or reduced lunch. Half of them had 100% of their student population free or reduced lunch. Most of them are located in Central and Southeast Arkansas. And so we know just by looking at this map, and just so you know, the green map is where these 33 schools that received an F are lo located. And the map on your right is where our prisons and our juvenile detention centers are located. And so you can see by looking at these two pictures where our schools are underperforming, that is where our prisons and juvenile detention centers are most likely to be located. There is a, people believe it's a myth that they build prisons based upon third grade reading levels, but it's not a myth at all. And so we can see here that prisons are built in the areas where our schools are the lowest performing. 
when we look at discipline, it's the same thing along racial lines. Nationwide black students are three times more likely to be suspended than their white counterparts. That's true in the state of Arkansas where they're twice as likely to be suspended for the same infractions. So if a black student is truant 30 days and a white student is truant 30 days, nine times out of 10, the black student will be suspended and the white student will not. And we also are noticing that in central and southeast Arkansas, Black students and students in general are more likely to receive corporal punishment. Yes, that still exists in some of our Arkansas schools and out of school suspension. This chart, um, it's very busy, but I wanted to make sure you all saw this. The most important thing to point out is that on the left hand side, you have the largest districts in the state, Springdale, Little Rock, Benville, Rogers, Fort Smith. And for those of you interested, Pulaski County is number six. But when you look at expulsions and out of school suspensions and in school suspensions, you'll see some districts that aren't the largest in the state. And yet they have some of the largest out of school suspensions and in school suspensions um, in the state. This is five year data. So I don't want anyone to think Little Rock suspended, uh, expelled a thousand students in one year. But I do want you to notice that Springdale is the largest district, but they only expelled 77 students in five years compared to Little Rock, who's expelled 1,150 students over the course of five years. And also I wanted to note that Blytheville and El Dorado are very small school districts, high minority, high poverty, but they have suspended several students. Um, and so it's just alarming that these, these things are happening in these smaller districts and high minority districts. So connecting the dots, this is what you all wanna know. When a student is suspended, they're more likely to drop out of school. Students who drop out of school are more likely to go to prison or become unemployed. 23% of students suspended come in contact with a juvenile probation officer. And students who are suspended or expelled are more likely to fall into the juvenile prob probation system. This is how it happens. And the chart on the right shows you students, as you receive more suspensions, the more likely you are to drop out and the less likely you are to attend college, which is the green line. So the final section is from policy to practice. What can we do? What can we do about this? And I know you guys are gonna talk about this in two weeks, but I did wanna share some positive things that are happening in the state and where I think you all could capitalize and do even more. Um, there needs to be more research. Of course, there always needs to be more research because we need to know specifically which students are being suspended and expelled and why. And then I wanna look at practice. Who's, who, who are the principals or schools that are doing the good things? And then talk about minority teachers and where they fall into this equation. So the first piece is policy. Over the last, and I won't go through these in details, but over the last uh, five years, Governor Hutchinson and his team in the legislature have introduced some bills that are trying to intervene before students are suspended or expelled. Um, Senator Dismang out of BB actually introduced the bill very recently saying that they want, to in, they want to make sure students' adverse experiences are taken into consideration before they are expelled. And I, I hope it was passed, I believe it was, but I think that's a great move in the right direction to prevent students from being sent to juvenile detention centers. Uh, when we talk about research to practice, the state um, released a report on which schools were disproportionately suspending black students and a principal in Stuttgart um, she, Principal Pam Dean, I don't know if she's still there. This was about a year or two ago. But when she found out her school was on the list, she intervened immediately. She didn't wait for someone to come in and say, you need to do something about this. She identified a group of about 30 students who had been suspended or had gotten in trouble. And she got them, she, they assigned them a high school mentor. They implemented incentives for those students. And they hired a social worker to come in the school and talk to parents and talk to teachers. And she also required monthly bias trainings for her teachers. And they saw a 30% decrease in student uh, negative behavior almost immediately. So I wanted to highlight what she did because I think if we spread this around the state, we'd solve half of, half of this issue could be solved if we implemented this in all of our elementary schools. And the last um, thing I'll talk about is minority teachers. This is an issue that I, I don't think gets enough attention in the state, but I did want to highlight it on this call. Minority teachers, according to, to research, specifically Black teachers, are strong ro role models, strong mentors. They have higher expectations of students. There's even research that says students of all races enjoy and prefer their Black and Latino teachers, and they're also less likely to suspend or expel students. Unfortunately, in the state of Arkansas, our teacher workforce is 90% white. Um, this chart is a little dated, but 
It is 90% white. Black teachers make up about 8% of the teacher workforce today, but I can tell you that the number of black teachers in the state of Arkansas grew by four over the last year, four. Um, and we are fearful that due to COVID, we're gonna lose a lot of our black teachers because many of them are not certified due to their challenges with the Praxis exam, which is the, the subject of my dissertation. And so one way we want to um, help get more black teachers in, in the classroom is to give them intensive support on their, their test prep because this is a historical issue. Black teachers and test takers have struggled with this exam for decades and no one has really found a solution. And so that's one thing that I do with my sister um, is to help more black teachers get hired in the state of Arkansas so we can help alleviate some of these suspensions and expulsions. And I'm done. <laughs> Brenda, well, did I go over my time? Well, you know, you really do have a little more time if you, there's anything you felt like you rushed over. It was so uh, captivating to watch what you said. And uh, so if there's anything else you want to, to highlight, uh, I was thrilled to see that you were working with the Praxis because when I was on the State Board of Education, that was such a problem. And we kept looking at the cut scores and changing those and trying to amend those. And uh, when we would have areas of critical need in our state like special ed and others, uh, we just had so many people that could not get past those Praxis tests. They had to have uh, you know, special tutoring and all sorts of things. So. I think that's wonderful that that is your area of expertise because it is so needed and it does not just apply to teachers of color. I mean, it's a real yeah. challenge to, to all of our uh, people who want to enter education in the classroom in Arkansas. I think the, the only thing I would add, I'm so glad you brought that up, is it's true. So my twin sister and I created the Test Prep Institute to help specifically Black teachers with the exam. But when I moved back to Arkansas, I quickly realized this is an issue for almost every demographic group in the state. Um, and we are working with over 100 teachers on almost every exam offered in the state. And what we found is that because of the condition and the state of our K through 12 schools, many college students are entering with maybe, I mean, if we're being honest, they're at a ninth or 10th grade level. And so we have to get them up to the college level in order to be prepared to take these exams. And to no fault of their own, many of them simply need the resources, the, the flashcards, um, the online courses, some things that you know they're not able to afford as college students, we're able to fundraise and help them um, get those resources. And these exams are extremely expensive. Um, to become a kindergarten or a K-6 teacher in the state of Arkansas, you have to take five exams. Um, and the total is around 500 and something dollars. And so a lot of it is just fundraising and finding support for those teachers. And, and thank you for allowing me to, to share that because this is, it, it clearly is what I think about every day. <laughs> okay, Tina, thank you so very much. Um, no I just appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Christopher Burks, an attorney. And uh, he goes by Chris. He's got his uh, Jewish doctorate uh, in 2010, he graduated from the University of Arkansas Law School, and he's a 2007 graduate of Davidson College, and he's a little bit modest, I think, on his resume in that he's a, a husband and a father, and he's worked done a lot of work for Arkansas advocates for uh, uh, families, and he's also uh, been involved in state government, so he comes to us with a rich background other than uh, just being, not just, but being an attorney. Chris successfully sued in a class action lawsuit uh, in Pulaski County Circuit Court on behalf of the pipeline alleging the Little Rock School District and the Pulaski County Juvenile System operate an unconditioned, unconstitutional school to prison pipeline that is disparately impacting African Americans. And here is a quote, according to the lawsuit, and I quote, African Americans in Little Rock School District are more likely to receive out of school suspensions for the same offense, more likely to be arrested for school based offenses, and once detained are more likely to stay detained longer than other races. And so with a great deal of experience uh, on this subject, I present to you, Chris Burks. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, Brenda, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for uh, the work you do for the United Methodist Women. Uh, the panelists and I, uh, Tina and Kevin, we were talking beforehand about how encouraging it was um, that everyone was together tonight. I, uh, I hope the rest of the audience feels the same way that uh, sometimes when you're, you're out working by yourself, it's good to come together um, and, and realize that um, you know, together we can accomplish a lot. And, uh, I do have a presentation like Tina, I'll get into it. I, I did want to uh, thank Tina. Uh, I think I'm sort of the, the intermission here between Tina's great presentation and then Kevin comes, comes after for uh, a powerful closing, but I, I felt like I was in school with Tina there. It was just uh, the statistics were very, very powerful. And, and certainly this material can, it can be heartbreaking. Uh, you know, it, these are, these are real people. This is, um, uh, these are our, our kids, our, our children. Uh, this is our community, but I think it, it's also encouraging uh, when we come together on it. So I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen with my presentation. And I think there's a, there's a chat feature and there's also a time for questions later. So uh, certainly I think all the panelists, we want to want to hear your feedback, hear your questions. This is a, uh, this is not a Little Rock issue as, as Tina identified. This is not an El Dorado issue. Uh, this is an issue that affects each and every one of our communities across the state. Uh, so, um, you know, if nothing else, I think tonight will, will show us that it, it affects all of us. So I'm going to go ahead and get into the presentation. Well, okay. Um, can everyone see my share screen? We can. Okay, that's good. So the, the title of my presentation is Making the Pipeline Personal, a Case Study in Little Rock. And what I mean by social change is using the court system, um, not just to win money or to win a result, but to change laws, to have laws enforced uh, it's a, a long tradition, not just in this country, but in other countries, but um, that is what we're going to talk about. In terms of the, the overview and the objectives for the presentation, um, you know, talk briefly about who I am and why I care, um, and then talk about uh, the pipeline and, and talk about the case. And I'm going to actually try to share this a little bit better briefly. Okay, in terms of who I am, uh, there's an old picture of me. Um, I, I'm an attorney, as, as Brenda mentioned. Um, I have two little girls. Um, I, I lived here for some time, like a lot of y'all. Um, this is not the first lawsuit, the lawsuit I'm gonna talk about that I've been a part of that is um, intended to bring social change. Um, I'm a, a proud graduate of, of the school district that was involved in this lawsuit. Uh, that's one of the many interesting things about this case is that um, sometimes you have to uh, take action involving things you love. I, I love the Little Rock School District. Uh, I love the state of Arkansas, but that doesn't mean that um, they can't do better. Um, I want to briefly talk about, you know, why we care and, and why y'all are all here. Um, of course, there's certain values that are common, you know, not just to the United Methodist women, but to... Um, I. I think humanity, I mean, these are universal values. Um, and I think the challenge for me as a lawyer and uh, certainly for education PhDs or ministers, whatever your profession is, uh, I think the challenge is how do we live those values? How do we act on those values? And, and how do we make a difference and not just preach to the choir? So, you know, those, I, I really think value-based messaging or incorporating values into the work you do um, really helps not just with the appeal to those who share the values, but it, it shows people your purpose and it gives purpose to what you do. I, um, I think this lawsuit tried to communicate those values in a way that persuaded people um, who otherwise uh, were, were opposed to change for a reason or another. And I just want to give a brief story. You know, one of the, the big reasons that I care so much about 
what we call the school to prison pipeline specifically. Um, and, we, and we call it that because students at school are getting arrested for things they should not be arrested for. And they're being put in a system that actually makes them worse over time. It, the, the pipeline is negatively reinforcing, uh, as Tina pointed out. And you know, one of the reasons I care so much about that um, is, is me as a, as a Caucasian, as a white guy, privileged guy in Little Rock. Um, you know, if I got in an argument with my best friend at recess, which I did one time, um, I got to go stay and have extra recess and work out my issues with my friend. We, we talked it out. But other people, um, African-Americans in my school, I, I never saw them getting extra recess when they got in trouble. Um, I saw them getting kitchen duty. Uh, and I think that was unconscious bias, probably on the part of, um, you know, the assistant principal. Um, but it, it was personal to me. I've remembered that my whole life. Why didn't I get kitchen duty? Why did um, an African-American child? And, and if you take that example and you multiply it across the system, across Arkansas, that's what we see. And then briefly, again, I, I'm so impressed with Brenda and the United Methodist Women, but there's a proud tradition of the United Methodist Women here in Arkansas specifically of coming together and making social change. I, I put on the slide, the Women's Emergency Committee. Uh, if everyone is not familiar with that, that's a group of women in Little Rock who got together uh, in the segregation crisis in 1957. The, the group was perhaps not as, um, progressive as they may seem in hindsight, there's, there's always more to the story, but it is a great example of doing exactly what y'all are doing, which is coming together, hearing from people, um, learning how to make a difference. Um, and and we, there's just such a proud example of that in Arkansas. Tina did such a good job talking about what the pipeline is in Arkansas. This slide has a, an Office of Education Policy report from the University of Arkansas um, that was presented to the, the State Board of Education that, that Brenda was on. And I won't go into all the details, but um, essentially when you, when you zero in on some of the, at the school level, what you see is that schools with a, a higher percentage of black or African-American students are the schools that are disproportionately um, meting out this, this punishment. Um, and, and Tina did such a good job of saying, look, a white student and a black student have the same infraction. The result is different for the black student. And that just goes back to the values that, that I mentioned briefly. I mean, everyone, Republican, Democrat, independent, that, that offends everyone's common sense of decency and fairness. Um, it, just, it just shouldn't happen. Um, specifically in the, the Little Rock School District, so I'll talk a little bit about the, the lawsuit in a second, but um, Little Rock McClellan is a high school here. Um, it, it has been combined with um, Jay Fair to have a new Southwest high school, but the, the statistics for this particular year in McClellan and other years um, were just not good. And um, you know I have a good friend that is an assistant principal there, friends with teachers there. Uh, my clients went there, but so I, I'm not, being negative about the, the work that everyone is attempting to do there. But the statistics show you um, what has happened. And um, at McClellan, if you're African-American, you're gonna get suspended for something that if you were African-American at Little Rock Central, you would not. And that was, that's just a, a statistical fact. And the good thing about the court system is, is we can take those statistical facts um, and use that to make change. I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Um, and so here's some data, and, and Tina did a, a good job of talking about the state, you know, just in kind of this, this one time period uh, in the Little Rock School District, and Tina mentioned this, African-Americans are more likely to receive an out-of-school suspension for the same offense. And we know that an out-of-school suspension is, is worse because it involves learning loss. If you're in school, even if you're in detention in school, you can still do your homework. You still have access to internet. If you're out of school, you lose those resources. Um, and again, the, the data shows, as Tina mentioned, once someone is arrested and is in the juvenile system, um, you have a disparity there. A, a white student who's arrested at school and presented to the juvenile intake, uh, and things have gotten better, is, is not going to be detained um, as long as uh, an African-American student. And one of the things about the lawsuit is that we use the data that the state and the county produced themselves. Uh, so the footnotes here on this slide are... That is data that the, the county produced in their own analysis 
uh, and also that was presented to the state uh, in their own analysis. So we're not um, we're not making up the statistics in this case. We're using what uh, what the government had produced itself to try to show this disparity. Uh, and again, this this slide shows that um, you know the state was on notice of this disparity uh, in the school district was. And, and there are a lot of things in the school district that, that people have worked on to fix this. Again, I'm not trying to, to be too negative, but um, the, the data speaks for itself. Um, and here on this slide is kind of a key point that, that I briefly mentioned earlier. Um, African-American students in the Little Rock School District are disproportionately in schools where they are suspended and arrested for incidents that would not get non-African-American students suspended and arrested. So again, something that happened to an African-American at McClellan or Fair or now Southwest would not get that African-American student suspended at Little Rock Central. Um, and the good thing is the law has a remedy for that. Um, I have a, a, a brief slide here to just put it in context. I mean, this, this point is so heartbreaking to me, um, but essentially um, a lot of people push back and say, well, it, it's not so much about race. Um, maybe it's more about income. And the data just does not support that conclusion in my experience. Uh, it, it is not just about income. And this study shows that it, it is about race. Um, and, and so this study shows that black men raised in the top 1% <clears throat> were as likely to be incarcerated as white men raised in households earning $36,000. And this is a longitudinal study over time. And again, um, it, it's not just about income. You can't control for income in the Little Rock School District um, and get um, an explanation for what happened. Uh, it, what happened was due to, to race. Um, this, this next slide talks about, and I briefly mentioned this earlier, um, using the courts for social change. And I have on here a Brandeis brief. Some of you may be familiar um, with this concept, but the idea is instead of just making legal arguments to a court, you actually show the social science to the court and show why things um, need to be changed. Um, and you know the example here on this slide for a Brandeis brief, which is exactly what we did in this class action case with the Little Rock School District, um, it actually came about first in a case, uh, later Justice Brandeis used it in a case, um, Mueller v. Oregon about uh, women regulations and restrictions on women. So I thought that was appropriate. This, this idea of a Brandeis brief that was used by Thurgood Marshall and Brown v. Board that was used in Mueller, it came out of uh, these laws that really discriminated against women. Um, that, the other case that I have on this slide, Cooper v. Aaron, uh, that is the, the long-running litigation that came out of um, the 1957 Little Rock Central High Crisis. But again, one of the lessons of Cooper, Cooper v. Aaron in the Brandeis brief is that we can use the courts for social change, um, that, that a, a judge um, who has just a, a little bit of courage and perhaps a fair reading of the law um, can invalidate a law or can uphold the law in a way that um, ends uh, this, this type of racial disparity. So this next slide is, uh, I try to have what I call straight talk or more direct talk um, about this case. And, and I'll just briefly describe the case. Um, what it was is moms and grandmothers, not unlike you on the call, who decided that they were tired of one-off issues of, of dealing with uh, discipline, that, that they were uh, you know, sick and tired of being sick and tired is, is kind of the saying. And um, it was moms and grandmothers looking out for their kids, but also um, for other kids, uh, it, just like y'all are doing tonight. And one of the, the hard parts about this case and any class action case is it's public and there's a lot of social pressure not to be involved in a lawsuit, uh, to stay out of things. Uh, and so my clients in this case, I'm, I'm just so proud and encouraged by them that they wanted to put their name on the line. Um, but what this slide shows is that essentially, in, in my opinion, uh, the staff is overwhelmed at a lot of our schools. It's easier sometimes to arrest a minor than it is to engage in preventative uh, discipline. Um, you know, the, the mom reached out to me and we started the case. What the lawsuit actually said is that the district had a policy that it selectively enforced, that it was vague. Essentially, the policy in the district was a policy for what they called disorderly conduct. And that 
that policy was being used to arrest African Americans. They were being accused of disorderly conduct. Um, but the, a white student was not being arrested for disorderly conduct. And, and teachers in the district knew that disorderly conduct was an easy way out of an infraction. Um, what was different about this suit than a lot of other lawsuits is that we used state law, um, the state constitution, which was um, better in this instance than federal law. The, the classic example of that in Arkansas of using the state constitution um, to make change is, is what's called the Lakeview case or the Lakeview cases that ruled our whole system was inequitable uh, of educational funding. And so this lawsuit um, did a similar thing. It said, based on the state constitution, um, the way the Little Rock School District disciplines African-American students is unconstitutional under the state constitution. Um, and I'm, I'm getting close to wrapping up, but I wanna give you uh, some irony about that. The reason that the state constitution has more protections than the federal constitution is actually a bad reason. Um, when it was written, it was written uh, essentially to sort of keep out what people thought were carpetbaggers and have a stronger state government against a federal government. Uh, so it, it's kind of this weird um, flip in time that these provisions in the state constitution that were intended for bad reasons. They were intended to discriminate. They're intended to keep out others and treat people differently that over a hundred years later, uh, we can use those provisions in a positive way. Um, so that's just an interesting twist in the law. Um, and so, you know, just to kind of get to the closing and to wrap up um, this case, um, we filed it with the moms and grandmothers who are so courageous, whose kids should not have been arrested. And a lot of what the district agreed to do, they were already doing in one form or fashion. That's been my experience in education. There's so much going on in education. A lot of times it's, it's just about kind of focusing and, and getting the, the key parts together. But what the district agreed to do as a result of this class action is keep a peer mediation program uh, in place at Southwest High that intervenes and prevents before there's an arrest, before there's a fight. Um, you know, the, the district had not necessarily funded peer mediation uh, in the way that we wanted it to. There was already social workers on staff in the district. But again, uh, this lawsuit, the district agreed as a result of it, they will have social workers there permanently. Uh, and the training, they were already doing some prevention, intervention and treatment training, uh, but they agreed to do that in a legally binding way. Um, and I have on here just briefly as I, I wrap up some of the problems for, for this case, and then I'm sure it's the case with any type of change that anyone does, uh, you know, it, it's just the, the sin of, of pride. That's a big one. Pride in being right, pride in ownership. Um, you know, it, it, that's natural. Anytime you, you try to change something, there's just a lot of pride. Um, and so I, I hope people are encouraged tonight if they run into, um, you know, something that is hard to do that, that look, it's, um, you know, we got to think out of the box. Um, and, and get beyond that. And then the lastly, um, what I mean by end-to-end -end change, you know, this lawsuit by itself um, certainly accomplished what we just talked about. But I think in my experience as an attorney, to really make a difference, you need all levels of change. You need one-on-one um, -on -one tutoring. Uh, you know, Tina mentioned um, training for teachers. I, I think um, one cannot work as effectively without the other. So uh, when you're looking at what you're gonna do and when you're encouraged, I think you have to look at the, the individual level of tutoring, but I think you also have to look at a neighborhood program, a teen court program, a job program. I think you have to look at the state level, like Tina mentioned, uh, money for summer and after school and diversion programs. And nationally, I think you have to stay plugged in to what the United Methodist women are doing. Um, lastly, I'll just have a, another slide on on getting out and voting and, and what I call civic revival. I think that's so important uh, and I'll share this presentation too, but I, I just think that um, as the United Methodist women, as people that care about these issues, um, I, I think if you um, approach change in a loving way, in a positive way, it will encourage others. Uh, that's been, been my experience with this case um, is that, that other people will see your love and they'll be drawn to it uh, and together we can make a difference. So thank you so much. Chris, thank you so much for that compassionate uh, program. And, um, you know, the uh, the information that you shared, you and, and Tina both, 
uh, as we studied this as United Methodist Women, much of our statistics that we hear about come from bigger cities like Miami and New York and San Francisco and other places. And I think it's easy to not realize that something is right in your neighborhood or in your door uh, if, if you don't hear these kind of statistics that you all have given us. So thank you so much for really uh, making this pipeline personal. And also, uh, Chris, I wanted to say to you that uh, I was so privileged to serve as the vice chairman of education under the iconic uh, Jim Argue, who is one of the, the most beloved names in Arkansas United Methodist for his work at the foundation. And then of course he was such a wonderful Senator. And we were there together on the special session that resolved finally the Lakeview case and got Arkansas out from under the unprecedented move of the uh, Supreme Court to say that Arkansas was inadequate and inequitable and the special masters actually took over the state and education, which as you know, is a function of the legislature. So that was so uh, thrilling to be part of that lawsuit because I think maybe it's one of the most important uh, educational actions we've taken in this state to date. Yeah, absolutely, Brenda. And thanks again for your leadership and pulling this together. And just to, to echo your comments, thanks to Kevin and Tina. I think um, you know, as a little bit of a younger attorney than Senator Argue, seeing the work that you did and he did uh, inspired me to bring this lawsuit. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up seeing that in the paper and reading that, and, and I hope um, people will see what we did and what Tina does and, and Kevin's example and, and be inspired likewise too, because um, without, you know, for example, your work and Senator Argue's work, Collins Kilgore was actually the trial court judge who first made a decision to hold the system that the state Supreme Court later found. Uh, that was kind of an unpopular decision that, that Collins Kilgore made. Uh, and I think, you know, your work and Senator Argue's work, there was some pushback in the legislature from that. It was, it was not necessarily the most popular. Um, but I think the, the lesson for me is don't, don't worry about popularity, you know, try to try to do the right thing for our kids. Uh, so I, I appreciate you adding that. Thank you so much. And now it just gives me great pleasure to bring to you another wonderful speaker and, and a resource, uh, Kevin L. Hunt. And as I mentioned earlier, I thought it was interesting. He put senior after his name and I thought, my goodness, I was thinking he would be young and he is young. And uh, he put senior because he's the proud father of Kevin Hunt Jr. So we know right off the bat that he's a, a father and a husband but oh my goodness, so much more. Uh, Kevin is an author. He's an entrepreneur as his business is called Lessons Learned. He's the founder of a nonprofit uh, entitled Inspiring Other People. And he's the host of a podcast, Your Voice, Your Reason. But Kevin dropped out of school in junior high. And according to him, his life went into a downward spiral for many years afterwards. However, in 2001, he earned his GED and enrolled in Philander Smith College, later receiving his business degree with honors. Uh, and pressing on, Kevin got his master's degree in 2015 from Webster University. Kevin currently serves on the board of the Arkansas Coalition of Juvenile Justice and the Watershed uh, uh, Organization. And uh, his book, which was published in 2018, is entitled, Why Me, God? And the answer, because I ordained your steps. So I proudly present to you, Kevin Hunt. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. Uh, I'm just grateful to be here. And thank everyone for just having me here. It's just an honor just to see be a part of this and know about uh, all the work that everybody is doing, even though I, I didn't know, you know, people just different parts of the state just care about uh, our young people. And I'm excited about that uh, because I'm, I'm starting to meet new people every day that's doing stuff around prison reform. Uh, uh, just, just so much work that needs to be done that I have been able to connect and work with different people. And I just want to say, Tina and Chris, man, I wish I can have you all on the Arkansas Coalition Juvenile Justice Board with me. 
uh, because I think we can make a really uh, a, a difference uh, if you all was on there. So that's just a thought. And thank you for the audience here. And I won't hold you long. I know I have a certain amount of time and I just want to share my story with you all. Uh, and I may not be able to get into all my story, but I want to be able to share something. And I and I thought about adding my slide, just a couple of pictures here and there, but I just want to, I just, I've just put the slides aside and just kind of uh, talk to you all a little bit about Kevin Hunt and who I am and where I come from and how I got to where I am today. Uh, as of today, I am a father of a, a young man. He's um, uh, played basketball. He currently just graduated from Moorhead State in, in Eastern Kentucky, and he's going to finish his last two year of basketball at the University of Denver. So we're preparing to go travel there in June. Uh, I have a lovely wife named Maggie. Uh, she's a wonderful person, the love of my life. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner, so she's very busy. And I belong to a wonderful church, a Second Baptist Church on John Barrett, Dr. Kevin A. Kelly. And I'm just involved with so many other different things. And the thing that I love the most is just the work that I do in the schools. I, I used to work at the University of Arkansas Clinton School and Center on, Center on, Center on Community Philanthropy. Help, help me, please. But anyway, and I just knew that God had another calling for me. And, uh, and I just felt like it all the time I was there, even when I worked in the governor's office, I knew it was something else I should be doing. And that something else was to go work with those kids. So I created this program called Lessons Learned. So I take all the lessons that I have learned over the years and the good and the bad, and I just put them in this big old pot of gumbo. And my program came out as a student intervention development program. And basically, even though it's a wonderful program, uh, on paper and everything. But the, the biggest part of, of my program is the relationships that I build with those kids. And once I start building relationships with the kids, then I can start directing their, directing them and giving them solid, sound advice. And it, and I challenge them and hold them accountable. And it was a wonderful thing that I got that off the ground really well in 2019. And then, of course, COVID hit. But um, the great thing about it, I will be back in the Little Rock School District because that's where I was at. And just to see those young men and women made me think about my life when I was younger. And I am also trying to prevent this, um, the school to prison pipeline. And that's what I work on every day when I'm in those schools. And I love that job. And it's the greatest job in the world. And I wouldn't trade that job for anything. So I just want to share that with you a little bit. But yeah, so when I, my name is Kevin. Uh, when I was younger, uh, I say I had some challenges when I was in school, probably third, second grade. You know, I, my mother was going through some things on her own. She had some, some challenges, you know, dealing with drugs. My father, he was... He was a father. I didn't see him that much. So me and my siblings had to, was at home so much a, a lot. I used to go to school. We was I was already behind because I missed so many days. It was like the third and fourth grade. And I was upset because I couldn't see my mother. But while I was in school, you know, the, the education wasn't very important. It wasn't important to me for once. Uh, but it wasn't important to the teachers. It was just like more of a baby citizen. So we was in school. We acted up and did a lot of crazy things and and throwing pencils. And I always, at that time, they used to do small paddlings and stuff. And so I always was in Mr. Mordrew office getting paddles all the time. So I remember those days. And as hard as they hit me, it seemed like I would have tightened up in the classroom, but I never did. And I was upset about going home every day. For once, I knew we were going to have a real solid meal for that for that particular evening. Second, I knew my mother wasn't going to be there. And thirdly, either the lights, water, gas was going to cut off. And sometimes, uh, two out of the three was cut off. And so when you're dealing with all those challenges in, uh, in every day, then when you go, go to school, you're not the happiest person in the world. And I, that was me and many of my friends as well. And so I reacted in the school. And every time I reacted in the school, I get sent to the office, or I get sit in the hallway, or I get suspended, and I suspended and suspended. And next thing you know, by the time I got in sixth grade, uh, I couldn't read, write a spell at all. And, and I was so embarrassed because of uh, when a time when a teacher asked someone to spell a word or read a sentence or anything, and she called on me, I used to get so mad and kick the table and do something to get thrown out of class because I didn't want to be embarrassed trying to read, read or spell a word that I should have known how to read and spell. And this carried me on all the way up until my seventh grade year. And I knew I couldn't read, write, or spell. And I played basketball for some reason. Now, when I look back on it, how in the world was I able to play basketball in the seventh grade? But I also, went, when I went to the eighth grade, I was able to play basketball in the eighth grade. And so that carry on, I still couldn't read, write, or spell. Uh, no one really cared. And I think at the time, they may have known about the school to prison pipeline. And, and most of my teachers, they even had one that told me that I was going to end up in prison. And she was correct. So after my junior high year in the eighth grade, I, I think I tried to go to the ninth grade. But I, I can't remember because my mother had gotten so much trouble and she went to prison. And when she went to prison, 
uh, we stayed with my grandmother and my grandmother had my other auntie kids and she was on drugs and then my uncle was on drugs and then my cousins that stayed in the house was on drugs and then my older brother got on, on the drugs and later on in my life, my youngest sister got on drugs. And so I had to deal with all of this going on in my life, my life and my family. And so once I, after my eighth grade year and, and maybe tried to go to the ninth grade, the following school year, but I wasn't sure. I got caught up in doing some of everything. We went started from snatching purses, uh, downtown Little Rock, start uh, riding stolen cars, breaking in houses, and then got hold of drugs and guns and started selling drugs and started committing small robbing. This is all at the age of 13 and 14 years of age. And then got caught into the gang stuff, which came into Little Rock, and I have some family that come from the West Coast. And they kind of introduced me and some of my friends. There was other people from the West Coast that introduced in these particular games. And we got involved with all that. And this is all the same time. I still couldn't read, write, or spell. Uh, couldn't pronounce not one word. Now, I love sports, so I was a basketball player. So I knew what a three-pointer was and a layup and a touchdown for football. So I understood that. And got caught up in games. And I started being involved with games over and over from 13, 14 to 15. And then got hold to gun. We was using guns and committing different type of robberies. And then by the time I turned 16 years of age, I was uh, in the juvenile courts all the time. Well, 15 years old, I was in the juvenile courts all the time all the time, back and forth, back and forth. And they was letting me out. I was running away from them, running away from home. I was being looked for. Then 16 years of age, uh, I committed an adult charge. And so by the time I was 16, committed the adult charge, but I went a little too fast. When I was 15, I ended up getting shot when I was 15 because I was involved with the gang stuff and someone did a, a, a drive-by shooting. We was out outside and uh, and, uh, and I got ended up catching a, a couple of bullets that day. I was 15, but about seven, eight months later, I ended up going to prison. Uh, me and some of my friends I went down to prison. I was very young, didn't even really know, couldn't spell prison. Got there, there was no rehab for anything and everything was just tough love and it was real rough. And so I stayed there for maybe about three years and three and a half years and I still couldn't read, write and spell. And here's a true story from a person that's still incarcerated uh, since I've been out. Uh, when I had got a year denial and then this guy asked me, to, he said, Kevin, you want me to write an appeal? And I think I think about this all the time when I asked myself, what is appeal? And he looked at me like I should have known what an appeal was. And I didn't know because I only had really a sixth grade education because that's when my learning really had stopped, maybe the fifth or sixth grade. And then I, he ended up writing an appeal. I got out. So this was in 1994. I got out, came home, and I still couldn't read, write, or spell, couldn't think, critical think, anything. So I got involved back into the same life that I once was, running from the police, selling drugs, game banging. Uh, maybe a, a year or two after that, I ended up getting shot again. And I, my life was just, my life was, was I was destined for either death for a long time in prison. But thank God that I had a, a grandmother, which she, she passed away in 2001. She used to always ask me prior to that, Kevin, won't you go back to school? But one thing I didn't tell my grandmother was that I was already defeated. I didn't feel like I can read, write, or spell. And there are so many stories that I can't get into you to prove that I couldn't read, write, and still spell. But I knew I couldn't read, write, and spell. And I always told myself, uh, uh, I'm a, I always told myself, I'm gonna just tell my grandma yes, just to get out of my way. I said, Grandma, I'm gonna go back to school. Where well, I told her this for about seven years. And in 2001, she passed away. And that hurt, hurt me so bad. And that was the first time in my life that I can remember ever crying outside when I was probably in elementary or something. And I cried and cried. And one day I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to give it a try. And it wasn't really for me. It was for my grandmother. So I said, I'm just going to try to go learn how to read. And I went to Shorter College Adult Education Center with Mr. Lloyd Husky and uh, got over there. And I can't even, I really don't remember how I actually went inside the building. That's a whole other story to that. Got in there and uh, went inside the Adult Education Center. And one thing that helped me out a lot. Now, I knew these all these women, Miss Bowles and Miss Waller. And Ms. Boys, Borkins knew that I couldn't read, write, and spell, but they made me feel like, Kevin, you can read. And, and they just kept loving on me and made me feel like I can read. Now, I knew I couldn't read, but they made me feel like I could read. And they played that old game on They got me really good, and that's the, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And they made me try. You know, just telling me that I could read, they made me try. And I tried, and I tried, and I kept trying, and I tried, and over the some months and months and just kept working on my writing and writing and speaking and, and everything. And I kept doing it over and over and over and over. And one day I wrote my first sentence and I Miss Wilder can tell you that. And I just felt so good about writing that sentence. And then uh, once I did that, my life just changed. It's just, and so I, I remember this one time she asked me, uh, uh, Miss Bowles, Bowles asked me, she said, Kevin, what's your favorite write, uh, rap song? 
And I said, y'all have to scream, I'm trying to speed up because I want to make sure I stay up in the time slot. She said, Kevin, what's your favorite rap, rap song? And I said, uh, I, I named some songs. She said, sing it for me. And I was quoting all, singing these songs, lyrics by lyrics, word by word. And then she said, Kevin, do you know what? She said, if you can remember those uh, lyrics word by word, she said, you can use that same memory to rewrite and spell. And something just went off in my mind, like, can I? I like, and I thought about it for a second. She said, yeah. You see how you quoted the lyrics that you didn't even see the words to? She said, you can you can use that same brain to learn how to read, write, and spell. And I had never been told that in my life, but that was the difference in my life when she broke that down to me. And it's just like so much had went off from there. And I realized that and I'm like, oh my God, it was just about me applying myself. It was about me believing. It was about somebody else telling me, uh, believe in me as well. So I went to the adult education and pretest the first time after about seven to eight months. And I passed the pretest. And I was a little nervous, but I was still learning and coming to class every day. Took the adult, uh, the GED test the first time, passed it the first time. Matter of fact, I had the highest score in that particular GED class. And I was just so excited and I couldn't believe it. And the only thing I could think about, all the lies that I told my grandmother for seven years that I was going to go back to school. And I said, oh my God, I wish my grandma could be here. But because of Ms. Bowles, because of Mr. Ms. Wilder, and Mr. Husky, and Ms. Borkin, that loved on me. And that was the biggest thing they loved on me. Now you have to remember, I didn't believe in God in 2001 nor did I believe in them up until 2005. I didn't want to hear anything about no God because I looked at everything that was going around me. So I just said, that can't be no God. Ain't no way in the world. But these were some God-fearing women. And because of them, and because of the love that they showed me, and because of how they kept encouraging me, and because of their strategy for me, I know they had a strategy. And uh, I was able to uh, pass my adult education uh, test. And then they encouraged me uh, to go, go to... Uh, go to, to college and I was just like, no, I just came over here for my GED and I was just so happy, but they played a little trick on me again. And I ended up going to Philander. And before I left them, Mr. Husky told me, he said, Kevin, go hang around some people that want something out of life. And that's something I had never did in my life before, hung around people, positive people. And when I got to Philander, I sought out some positive people and, and the rest was history. And I want to just kind of cut it short uh, because I know time is very limited. And I just want to thank you, Ms. Brenda, for this opportunity to share and uh, share my story with you all. Oh, Kevin, that's, you know, so, so touching. Well, I have a question for you, Kevin, because, uh, you know, you talked about your grandmother, and I hate to say this, but I'm a grandmother, and most of these women I know here tonight are too, and so grandmothers are very special, and uh, you talked about loving and supportive women, and that really is almost the definition of United Methodist Women. It is a fellowship of women who love God, and we work on behalf of women, children, and youth. And of course, you don't have to look very far in any community to find one or more Methodist churches. And uh, United Methodist Women is divided up and we have a, a unit in, in as many of these churches as we can. So I'd like to ask you, what difference would a community of women who loved God and loved you and cared about uh, youth, if you had had access to that early on in your life, what difference do you think that would have made? And what advice do you have for us about how we might get involved in interrupting uh, this school to prison pipeline? I would say if I had what I had growing up inside the schools, inside the community, I would never have went down the path I went because they introduce, and I know my mother uh, loved me and everybody know, but it's just a different when somebody, you see somebody else outside of your family that cares. And that did a lot to me. Uh, just, it just, you know, I'm kind of getting teary a little bit, but it's thinking about it, it's just the love that they showed me. And, and I was one of these people who think that no one loved me, no one even cared because of our circumstances. But when those ladies that didn't even know me had just met me, and loved on me like they have been knowing me all my life. And that made the difference in everything. So if a uh, mature group, I just say, uh, if you ever ever get a chance to just be involved in where some youth or young people, just go there and love on them and continue to show them that, that you love on them. And while Ms. Wilder, Ms. Ms. Husky, and Ms. 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 Wilder, Ms. Bowler, and, and Ms. Borkins was loving on me, they was preparing a plan for me to say, 
I want to show you how to be successful and like how to get to success. So they had already knew that they, they was going to plan on me going to, to uh, Philander Smith College. And they had always knew that they was going to make sure they put me in a, on the right path. And still today we are, they are my mentors. They are my friends more than anything. And I love those people and we stay in touch. And anytime I'm doing a the thing, they're just so supportive. So just go in with your love and caring heart in the name of Jesus and, and show those pers- people that you care. I guarantee you, you'll open up some eyes and you'll open up some ears and some hearts and they'll want to listen to you and be a part of what you're doing. Well, wow, that's just so, that's so uh, heartwarming to hear that. And of course, what you said about your embarrassment of not being able to read, write and spell. Uh, we have such an identification of special needs children who have even neurological and other problems that keep them from being able to read, write, and spell. And a large number of them also end up in the school to prison pipeline. So uh, you've touched on a lot of things there that really exacerbate this issue. Well, we do have some time and we would love to take some of your questions if we can. Uh, If you will uh, put your questions in the chat box and uh, our administrator, Jacob, can save this chat as well as we, if we don't get to all of them. And I will make it uh, my supreme effort to get the questions to the people and get the answers back to you if you will also indicate uh, in the chat. And we also can link you to your registration. So if you have any questions and I'll open up the chat right now and see, uh, we have several things that are uh, shout out from Lynn Baker. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, for the shout out for adult education and its impact on your life. Uh, Two awesome presenters and a powerful life testimony, all inspiring and motivational. Uh, To Tina, uh, saying to everyone, adopt a classroom or school and visit once a month or semester. That's a great uh, opportunity. Uh, And then from Alicia Finch, uh, great ideas, Tina, to be more impactful, more frequent visits might be necessary. Uh, Let's see, Uh, Tina, someone would definitely like to have your PowerPoint. Uh, And then uh, Alicia said at the beginning that she's a retired teacher and now a local pastor. And she worked in the Little Rock School District for 29 years and 10 spent as an administrator, four years as an assistant principal at FAIR uh, and worked as the assistant director of the Accelerated Learning Center uh, from 98 to 05. She returned to the classroom at ACC as a resource teacher. She can so relate, Chris, to what you have been saying. And Chris, I thank you for your compassion and your work in social justice. Uh, so anyway, we have several things uh, in there. We don't, I don't see any specific questions. Uh, but do you speakers have anything else you would like to add after you after your time was up? You thought, oh man, I wish I'd have said this. Because I'm well, certainly you this is Chris. Thanks again, Brenda. And I just wanted to to thank you, Kevin, for your your powerful example and and really testimony. Uh, I, that was um, yeah, very powerful. I, I really appreciate that. There is a, a chat now about someone mentioned um, when the pipeline begins and and when you begin working with families and. Tina may want to chime in. She, she's got all the research. I was so impressed with, with her statistics. And I, I do briefly uh, try to be brief. Lawyers are never brief, by the way. <laughs> they just always uh, talk and talk. But I do want to give a special shout out to a program that I think is particularly effective at stemming the school to prison pipeline. And that is peer programs. I'm sure Tina or Kevin, Kevin mentioned, you know, people that got involved in his life. Um, in my experience, and one of the things in this lawsuit is, is a, we mandated a, a peer program to help stem these issues because a, a lot of times, you know, developmentally as a kid, you're not, you know, you're not going to listen to your mom or your dad. Uh, there's a lot of social pressure to do something or not do something. And so uh, a lot of our courts, I, I worked for a juvenile court system, um, judge have teen court programs, um, but they need volunteers they need mentors. Um, they need, um, you know, Sunday school classes, United Methodist Women's Group to, to come speak with them, to come help them with the programs. I mean, there's a range of them, but in, in my experience in the system in Arkansas, there are two or three teen courts that are good and that are effective and that are stemming the school to prison pipeline. 
And then the rest of the state just doesn't have those programs tied closely to the juvenile court system uh, in a way that they should. So that that's a big, big shout out to teen court programs. Uh, and that's a big gap that, that I think could be filled in our state. So thanks again, Brenda. Okay, great. Uh, one thing I will tell you all too, is these are being taped and uh, we will have access to them uh, whenever uh, Jacob Turner lets me know. So we want to make them available uh, to as many people as we can. And so uh, that's one thing that you can know. Uh, Kevin, were you gonna say something? I saw your- Oh, oh yes, I, uh, two things I, I want to say. I don't know if I had shared with everybody that I had worked, ended up working in the governor's office, Governor Mike Bibi in 2007. And uh, and also that in January of 2021 of this year, as a matter of fact, uh, Governor Asa Hudson gave me a full pardon and everything, uh, I mean, gun rights and everything. So I just wanted to share that with you all. Oh, that's wonderful. That's I wanted, wonderful. sorry, Brenda, I was gonna add one thing. Yes. Um, I, so I, um, I lived in DC for 10 years. And while I was there, I taught uh, in, in Anacostia, which is the lowest performing high school in the city. Me coming from Arkansas, as you can imagine, that was just totally different from what I what I had experienced. Unlike Chris and Kevin, I'm from Moralton. And so I went to a very rural, small, majority white and conservative um, school district. I apologize, there's a little background noise. But when I was in Washington, DC, and when I was no longer teaching, but working in politics, I volunteered through a reading program um, at a local elementary school. And so for three years, I spent, uh, I spent one hour every week. I think I told Brenda this story, one hour every week reading to a kid as a part of this program called Reading Partners, which I've been a part of several tutoring and men mentoring programs. And I've never been a part of any like Reading Partners. Um, and I'll tell you a story about one student I worked with, Harold, uh, because I didn't talk a lot about my personal story, but like Kevin, listening to Kevin was very emotional for me because I'm younger than Kevin, but a lot of the things that he talked about, I hear stories in my family. For a lot of African-Americans in, Ar in Arkansas and in general, the drug crisis, whatever you wanna call it, infiltrated your entire family. And so a lot of those stories and those things happened to, to our family, but on a smaller scale. And so when I was reading to this student, um, his name was Harold, um, he was six years old and I went to read to him every week. Um, like Kevin said, there will be days where Harold was very angry and I knew something was going on at home or some days he would come in really excited and you kind of had to meet him where he was. And uh, after I finished working with him from January to May, um, by May, his reading level had gone up two grades and he was able to go to a local private school. I have a picture of me and Harold in my, in my house. And I always tell people the story of Harold because people had given up on him. You know, I had teachers who were telling me he might be too much for you. You may not, you know, you may want to switch kids. And I say, I never give up on the students. So let me, you know, give me a few weeks. Um, but one hour a week. It wasn't, you know, you know, every day or doing extra, a lot of extra work. One hour a week with one kid can change a child's life. And, and I know I'm, we're over time, but I just wanted to share that because there are so many Kevins. There are so many young people today, right now in a school somewhere in Arkansas, who if they have one of you coming in and showing them that they are important, despite whatever's going on in their life, like Kevin said, their families love them. But there are things that are going on that are just out of the child's control. But if every one of you mentor one child, that's already 68 to 100 children in the state whose lives could go in a different direction. And so I'm Again, I'm honored to be here and I really, I'm excited to see what you all are gonna do with this, um, with this initiative. Wow, that's great. Well, thank God for teachers. Someone just wrote in Virginia Himes. <clears throat> great presentation, love our children. Brenda, I love being Grant's teacher and that's my son. And I know you had your work cut out for you. And so I'm so, I'm so thankful uh, for all that love and learning. Well, we have come to the end of our first a segment on interrupting the school to prison pipeline in Arkansas. I know you'll join me in thanking our outstanding presenters. Uh, it's just exceeded my wildest expectations. Uh, you know, I just can't even imagine how, how great this has been. And I, I hope it has been for you all. And uh, we will make sure that you get 
uh, access to this information. And we will look forward to seeing you all next week at the same time when we have another stellar group of presenters that are gonna be talking about projects that impact the pipeline. And all of our presenters tonight talked about some things that can be done. And next week, we're gonna have some people that have specifically worked in that area. Levita uh, Wells-Hale, who's head, uh, headed up the Arkansas Out of School Network for 20 years, and Toyce Newton, a dear friend of mine, we served on the state board together, but she had the Phoenix Youth Center for over 20 years in CrossFit. And they will be able to talk to us about projects that really make a difference. So uh, God bless all of you, and we will see you next week. I uh, see y'all, thank you. Just a reminder for everybody, for next yeah. week, use the same link that you receive for this week's session. It will work for both next week and the week after. So keep that email so you can sign in next week.